Hey friends, there's something new from our sponsor, Text Control. Their new product, DS Server, provides document services out of the box for all platforms and languages. Whether you want to integrate document creation, editing, sharing, or collaboration into your web app, DS Server provides the back-end technology to integrate that professional document processing. For example, using DS Server, you could integrate an MS Word-compatible document editor into pure JavaScript, Angular, or an ASP.NET Core application. You can create PDF documents using web API calls or even request electronic signatures from end users. DS Server is also hosted on-premise in your infrastructure or with your cloud provider, such as Microsoft Azure. And you can test DS Server without downloading anything. Create your first DS Server application in minutes by requesting a trial token on their dedicated website at dsserver.io. That's DS. S-E-R-V-E-R dot I-O. Hi, I'm Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Cancel Minutes. Today I'm talking with Dr. Cynthia Lee. She's a senior lecturer in the computer science department at Stanford. And uh, you've won all kinds of awards. I'm looking at your bio here. Top 10 Papers of All Time Award at an ACM event. And uh, you have even worked at NASA and a number of startups. How are you doing? I'm doing great this morning. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah. So you, you've been teaching for a while. Um, do you decide what you teach? Like you just like go and tell the bosses or are you the boss who decides this is a class I'm teaching and you, that's what's going to happen, Stanford? Uh, both. So uh, my colleagues and I have a, a complex dance of a negotiation process about who gets to teach what of the courses that, um, you know, that we are all responsible for um, the core majors courses. But um, but I have gone to Stanford a few times and said, guess what? I'm teaching this other thing that I just invented. And that's what's happening. Um, so, that you know, that's some fun, too. But. That's cool. So you are all kind of negotiating and deciding and saying, yeah, you know, the people need more Haskell or they need more C sharp <laughs> or they need more whatever, right? Like the, you, you have to think about what the, what the, the people want in the sense of like how these young people will get jobs, but also what's topical, what's appropriate in the time that we're living in. Yeah. Yeah. It's of course, um, you know, how you can go into a bar in Silicon Valley and say, Space is not tabs, or you know, and <clears throat> start a bar fight. Um, so, well, a bar slap fight. Yeah. <laughs> Similarly, if you get a bunch of computer science educators together, uh, you can easily start a bar fight about what language should be the first programming language taught. Of course, is a perennial mm -hmm. battle. So, uh, we've in just in the past three years gone from um, a long time with Java. Um, a brief little stint with JavaScript, and now we're pretty settled on Python, in case you're wondering how that fight settled around here. I feel like I should have come down and tried to pitch C Sharp, but I will accept Java as, a, I'll accept Python rather as an answer for now. Okay. <laughs> so um, I'm not a huge fan of like the terms hard skills and soft skills, but I understand that not every computer science class, not every coded CS, whatever, 101 class is let's all write a for loop as a group. Some of them are talking about ethics and social structures and things like that. Why is that important for a computer science person's education? Yeah, so we actually have started um, formally introducing ethics models into all our core courses. So starting with the beginning programming and then also things like databases and systems, security. And uh, we'll have ethics modules that were designed by um, a moral philosopher PhD student um, who has a computer science bachelor's degree uh, that we hired to do this. And the idea was it's important for computer scientists to understand the impact they have on the world and to not treat it as kind of a side topic. You know, ethics was already required as part of an undergraduate education at Stanford. So we already knew that our graduates were um, getting ethics as part of their education. But we wanted to send a message that this is something that computer scientists care about and not something that is, um, you know, that other it's the job of other people to worry about. 
Now, some some people uh, on the kind of uh, polarized political spectrum that we have, at least in uh, North America right now, uh, think that you know colleges are filled with people of a certain political bent. Therefore, their classes might be trying to uh, you know inject political beliefs inside of something. How do you take something like ethics or a, 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 an analysis of like the spectrum of what's going on in a community and make sure that it is fact-based and dispassionate, or should it be, you know, life is political, tech is political, should, should, it, should it inject someone's political opinions? Mm. Yeah, I, you know, I have always been very careful about not um, putting politics in the classroom, even in terms of, you know, I think a lot of the times the way it sneaks in is um, with little jokes or asides that are not even really part of the actual lesson content, but that just kind of tip the cards in the professor's hand um, in a way that says, hey, this is the team that I'm on and we're all on the same team, right? And uh, I think it's actually little jabs like that that can feel most alienating to people in the audience who uh, don't feel like they actually do identify with that. Um, you know, as a very religious person, as an undergrad, I often felt like I was being hit by little jabs like that um, when it seemed to be taken as given that everyone in academia was and should be atheist. So, um, so I get that. I think it's very important to make sure that our classroom is welcoming and inclusive to all. There's a lot of good research that shows that um, if there's any kind of, you know, that lizard brain part of your brain that responds to threats, um, that if that is activated in any way, but from any cause in the classroom, um, physiologically learning is inhibited. The brain's ability to form new memories, process complex thoughts um, is diminished. So we have a real responsibility as educators not to make anyone feel that way. And actually, that's also the best reason for why we need everyone to have a certain amount of indoctrination, if you want to call it that, about exactly that, making a welcoming environment for everyone. Because the same thing about the physiological diminished um, ability to be your best brainiac self is true in the workplace, just as it is in the classroom. And so if our students are going to go out there, become engineering team leads, managers, CEOs of companies, founders, whatever they'll be, it's important for them to understand that if they want to extract the best value from their workforce, they need to understand how to make their workforce feel comfortable. And that includes a lot of people who, you know, coming from a lot of different places have a lot of different sensitivities. Yeah. You know, there's a, every time someone comes up with a quick label or an easy way to describe stuff like you just said, they'll sometimes take that and then they'll say that that word's a buzzword and we don't agree with that word. So for example, as you were describing that, I'm thinking, yeah, you want work to be a safe space. And then I'm like, oh, well, you can't say safe space because people don't like that word, <laughs> right. right? But But it seems like if we can forget about the buzzwords for a second, feeling like you belong, you want to go to work or you want to go to school and you're in a place where you can do good work, that I mean, I wanted that in the 80s. I, I wanted to go to school and not be beat up by the soccer team and put into a mm -hmm. locker. You know, if you want to call that a safe space, you want to call that being included or a feeling of inclusion, then yes, I would like to be included outside the locker that I was stuffed in. Um, so, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to go to work if I'm going to get shoved in a locker every day. Um, yeah. So, t yeah, it seems, seems like something we can agree upon. Okay. So, um, the lizard brain, though, that was a really interesting way to hit that because you're right. That fight or flight sense is not something I should feel when I'm going to Chipotle to get my burrito. Like, you know, I don't want to feel that fight or flight. And we're all having that right now because of the pandemic, right? When we go into places mm -hmm. that we don't feel mm -hmm. comfortable about. <laughs> but, you know, imagine what that would feel like going into a place like whether it be a region like Silicon Valley or a classroom like yours or, uh, at my job at Microsoft or someone's job at, at Google to go, ah, oh, my brain is my, every part of my body and my lizard brain is saying, I need to run away from this place, but I also need rent. So I will stay here. <laughs> yeah. And don't we all unfortunately know from that one job we had, um, and there's so much research showing as well, um, how 
bad for our mental and physical health um, a toxic workplace can be. I don't know if you had that job with a boss that just, you know, was making your life miserable or you felt trapped or or whatever the cause is. Um, it really feels like it can take years off your life. And I think that's been a great um, shift that we've seen, uh, kind of generational, but uh, I don't know exactly what the causes are. Not a business school person, but um, away from management styles that uh, are really, you know, a lot of verbal abuse. And you think of kind of like the the football coach in a movie, you know, where it's just really verbally abusive towards the players or so and and in coaching and in the workplace management styles I think we're thank goodness moving away from that and realizing that's not exactly the way to get the best work out of people yeah I try to evoke the Ted Lasso school of football yes. <laughs> uh, more yeah <laughs> more than the yelling and like if there's spittle involved in my in my stand-ups and, and flying <laughs> then I probably don't want that job so, so you're teaching a class now. It's CS 80Q. Um, what does that number mean, that 80? I, I'm used to like 101 and 201. That when, when a number is a lower number like that, is that just an entry-level class or an elective? Um, yeah, yeah, it's a complicated bureaucracy thing that I don't even totally understand. But it, it is a course um, that is meant to be for freshmen and sophomores um, as um kind of something a little, uh, it's part of a program called the intro seminar program that meant to be classes that are thought provoking, uh, fun for some sense of that. Um, and, and a little outside the usual requirements, but that just get students engaging with the world around them in a way that's, you know, a little off the beaten path. Yeah. So the class is CS 80 Q it's called race and gender in Silicon Valley. And the part that hit me the most was the, in the description here, it said, who decides who gets to see themselves as a computer person. And I've been in software now for 30 years. And when I am introduced at my family Thanksgiving and Christmas things, you know, the aunties will be like, Oh yeah, that's Scott. He's a computer person. And then I'll be talking to someone and, and they'll say, Oh, where do you work? I work at Microsoft. Oh, I use windows at work. Oh, cool. What do you, and then I'll, and then they'll apologize for not being a computer person. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like I've been, I've come in and I'm a, I'm like a visiting priest from another yeah. parish and <laughs> they're just like, Oh, I'm sorry, father. I'm, you know, I, I've lapsed or whatever. And like, why are you apologizing? If you don't, if you're not a computer person, it's okay. But why have I always felt like a computer person and why are they feeling like they could break the machine? What have we done to them to make them yeah. not feel included? They can't read. They don't know how to read. I'm on the cloister and I've got my, my, my 10 commandments and I can read it fluently and I can sit out on the, on the, on the, um, uh, the landing and I can lecture to them about the benefits of the bash shell. Uh, and they just, you know, but none of, but, but they don't feel included. It's just a conversation that's going downward for me. And, and as opposed to a, let's all sit around the fire and talk about it together. Yeah. Well, my dinner party, family gathering, auntie conversation usually takes the form. Oh, you have a PhD in computer science? You know, my laptop's been running really <laughs> slow lately. And it's like, uh, I mean, I could help you with that just based on my own kind of personal experience. But that's not really what they teach in a PhD program. But I assume um, that PhD programs mean that you can set the printer up, right? That's the whole... All that schooling. If you can't set up a printer, what's the point? I mean, the big secret of computer science departments is that they also have IT people, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> also this building, I swear, has the worst Wi-Fi on campus. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> gee, if only there were someone here in this computer science department building who understood right. computers. Who invented Wi-Fi. Who invented <laughs> Wi-Fi, right? Maybe we could. I wouldn't have to tether to my phone that I place on my windowsill of my office to get any email set. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but yeah, I, 
I like to focus the class around this question of who decides who gets to feel like a computer person. And the question is um, a little bit, uh, you know, not literal in the sense that I'm not imagining that there's one person who decided, you know, you get to feel like a computer person and you don't. But, but it's a fascinating kind of sociological thing, right? Because there's no way to argue that, um, you know, there's a, a gene for feels like a computer person uh, because the time scale of the existence of computers is minuscule compared to the time scale that evolution operates on. So <laughs> there's nothing, you know, that no one has evolved uh, meaningfully uh, in, you know, in relation to a computer. But... Um, but there is does, something, right? It you does know, make me wonder, people. like, <laughs> would would I be like a person, like on the, I don't know, on the, uh, the 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 banks of the Euphrates, well actualing people with scrolls and papyrus <laughs> leaves? And like, well, actually, um, in fact, like, where where was I two thousand years ago? The the computer person, you know, were we just annoying and replying to people <laughs> without Probably. asking? Going back thousands of years. But you point out that early childhood and educational experiences will set people up for success or failure and whether or not they identify themselves as a computer person in their relationship to technology. Yeah. I mean, it's such a common thing. I'm sure you've heard it. I hear it. um, Is um, people will say, my computer hates me. You know, and I teach our very first intro programming students and they'll come into office hours kind of apologetic that they need help, which is like never apologize for needing help. But let me tell you how often professional programmers Google the syntax for something <laughs> again every single day. But um, but they'll apologize for needing help and then say something like, oh, my computer hates me. And... Um, and I just wonder, uh, you know, how does that happen? And what, what are the things that we see in media or messages we get from our parents um, or in classrooms that lead some people to think that this is a world that is, um, that is open and available to them, that the kinds of knowledge that we have in this world um, are knowable to them? And, and some people get that and some people don't. And that's kind of my favorite thing about my job. I think of myself as a kind of midwife of computer scientists. And I don't know if you've ever been, um, spend any time on a farm or anything like that. Are you, well, you, you know, my brother, I'm in rural. Yeah. I'm in rural Oregon. My brother owns a farm. I've, my uncle owns a farm, uh, ducks and goats, all that. Yeah. Well, and you have kids too. So, but you know, whether it's a human or any animal, um, just a chick hatching out of an egg, there is something that feels sacred, you know, about being there at the birth of another living thing. And I feel that way about birthing new computer scientists that I I get (laughs) to be, um, you know, it's their relationship to the material that, that does the birthing, but me just getting to be in the room watching it is such an honor. Um, and, and I just want everyone to know that it's, it's not magic. I mean, it is magic in the sense that I love how magical it can feel at times, but, um, but it's not in the sense that it's knowable and it's not, I don't know if you know any magicians. My brother-in-law is a magician and I like, come on, Alberto, like, just tell me how you did that one. And he won't tell. <laughs> he will I, never uh, tell. <laughs> you, you could have asked me that question like a couple weeks ago. And I would have been like, I don't know any magicians. But now for the first time in my life, I can tell you that I was hanging out with David Copperfield last week. And what? Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, you can send this to your brother-in-law. It's on my YouTube. I spent an hour with him talking about the relationship between technology and magic. And the Arthur C. Clarke quote that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Mm, and yeah, Dave, uh, yeah. David Copperfield loves to say that the the technology that he's using for the magic he's doing today that I can have in five years when he's done with it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. But I want computer science. I want tech. I want software to be a place where... It's not like the Magician's Guild, where nothing makes us happier 
than to be in the presence of the birth of more of us, you know, yes. and yeah. to, to receive questions with joy. And, you know, when someone doesn't know something, um, this, I don't know if you're familiar with this compassionate coding movement. Yeah. Um, yeah and, you know, a great lesson um, that's been um, evangelized um, by that group is, uh, you know, when someone asks you, you find out someone doesn't know something instead of saying, what? You don't know that? To say, I'm so excited that I, that you don't know it because then I get to share it with you, you know? Yeah. It's, um, so just for context, for folks that are listening, uh, show 641 is called Compassionate Coding with April, April Wenzel. Yes. So you can check out that. That's from 2018. So I caught that one on the early uh, as that was starting to think be thought about. And now uh, you can check her out at CompassionateCoding.com. What's nice about that is that however I'm wired, I do like to, as my wife says, splain stuff. I don't know if I'm splaining, <laughs> if it's, I don't know if it's mansplaining or if it's everybody's planning, but when someone brings me the gift of a great question and they legitimately want uh, an answer, I get so excited because oh, now we'll both know mm -hmm. and I can splain. So it's permission to splain, you know what I mean? Yeah. And um, the one of the things that my family hates about me is that like there's any opportunity to like do a lesson. So my family comes over from South Africa. They're all sitting, they're all jet lagged. The young kids, the 15 year olds and 16 year olds are like, Hey, uncle Scott, why is it light here? It should be dark right now. And of course I grab an orange out of the center of the thing. I'm like, okay, this is the sun. All right, quick. That Kiwi is, is, the, is the planet earth. And like, we're doing like, you know, an, uh, an Ori of the, uh, like the, the entire solar system of fruit. And they're like, just tell us why it's dark here. I don't really want, <laughs> You're like, know but Galileo <laughs> said it exactly. moves. Yeah. How can you not be excited about that? So that's that feeling you get when someone realizes, wait a second, I never saw myself as a computer person my entire life. And now I get it. I understand the system. And, and, and then you get to go and say, huh? welcome. This episode is brought to you by Auth0. Auth0 knows the importance of a first impression, and when it comes to your business, that first impression is almost always the login experience. And with Auth0, your user gets the convenient login experience that they want with the security and privacy that your industry demands. An identity operating system designed for developers across all industries, Auth0 makes it easy to customize your ideal login with features like social login, multi-factor authentication, single sign-on, and more. Learn more at Auth0. Dot com. That's A U T H Z E R O dot com. So, in the class, though, you cover uh, student identity, but also their formation of their identities. And the, the, the talk is called, you know, the class rather, is called Race and Gender. So, you talk about masculinity and geek culture and race and gender. Why am I more likely, as a straight white guy from Oregon, to feel like, yeah, I'm a computer person? Pretty early on, I would say somewhere when I was 12 to 15, I was like, cool, you're welcome. Come on in. While someone else might feel like it's not their, not their fraternity or their sorority to be in. Yeah. Well, so let me ask you this. Where were you or how old were you? What were you doing in like mid to late 80s? Uh, mid to late 80s. I was uh, getting in the uh, middle of high school. Um, there was, a, there was an, a computer lab of like four computers. Um, we had just gotten an IBM PC, Apple twos were on the way out. Um, and I could go to the library and I would sign up on a sheet of paper for a half an hour on the, uh, on the computer. And then there was a very nice, uh, librarian lady there who would teach us the commands. Nice. So, uh, so this is fascinating graph, uh, you know, that shows, uh, from about 1970 to roughly the present, um, percentage of women in various um, high demand uh, professional fields. So law, medicine, uh, STEM fields of various kinds and includes computer science. And we see that um, from these formally credentialed things like law, medicine, uh, that require formal education that um, formally kept women out until, you know, 70s feminism. There's this steady increase from just about no women uh, to about 50 percent 
And and there's this one outlier among the lines on this line graph, and that is computer science is tracking those exactly until uh, about 1985. And then it not only plateaus at very below um, 50% where everyone else eventually plateaus, but um, starts going the other way. And the best theory I've heard to explain this is the advent of video games that were marketed to boys. And you know, those video game um, systems, whether it's console or on your Commodore or whatever you had, um, often required, you know, a little tinkering. They weren't quite as seamless a UI experience um, as a lot of our electronics are today. So, like, if you wanted to get anything to work on your PC, you're, you know, getting in there and messing with drivers and ms dos command line you know because otherwise your joystick yep. you is not going to work and you know yep. and so um so there was this fun highly motivational context to developing sort of as a byproduct of wanting to game all these technical competencies so then when students who had that very different experience outside the classroom, um, and of course, this is also tied to um, family economic status, you know, the ability to have computer or console um, at home, um, which is, of course, heavily tied to race in this country. So um, when those students with very different experiences with technology come into the computer lab, and, you know, the teacher says, okay, well, we only had enough budget for, you know, one computer for every two or three of you. So, you know, one of you take the keyboard and are all to watch, you know, guess who that, takes the keyboard? That's absolutely what happened. They would pair, we only had four, so they paired us up. Uh-huh. So, um, so you have this kind of butterfly wing effect of, you know, some marketing decisions that, um, that compound in the classroom, that compound when um, people writing TV and movies about people who play games observe who is doing most of that and writes that into the narrative. And then people consume that and it becomes even more cemented into our expectations and all these things just kind of self-reinforce until yeah. someone steps back and says, you know, maybe we don't have to do it this way. Well, and then I'm realizing this, I'm getting the eighties back in my head here. You've got, <laughs> you've got animal house and revenge of the nerds and the breakfast club and the, the um, archetypes are being formed in the brains. And, you know, I've, at this point, I've got white tape in the center bridge of my glasses <laughs> yes. and, you know, I've got my big buddy Holly glasses and I, you know, when I will actually, I push my glasses up with my, my pointer finger and I don't know why I'm doing it, but it's because, you know, Revenge of the Nerds is in theaters and you're right. The butterfly wing effect that you refer to that people who may, may not be familiar with that, that, that concept, right. A butterfly flaps its wings in Brazil and a hurricane starts off the coast of Florida. That's how things start, right? It just the snowball starts rolling downhill. That sounds like my 80s experience, but at no point did anyone make me feel like it wasn't my thing. But at the same time, they were selling Barbie dolls on on um, television where you'd pull the string and Barbie would literally say, math is hard. Mm -hmm. And and it, it took quite a while before that was pulled off the shelves because that just sets uh, not just gender roles, but just it, it puts you in a box says, here, this is your thing, right? You like Barbies, math is hard. And then you start having people, my, my son, he's like, I don't, I'm not good at math. He's already starting those tapes. And we need to catch those those tapes, see how old I am, I'm saying tapes. I don't know, those, <laughs> you know those MP3 files that run in your head? <laughs> I don't know why we say we have tapes running in our head. I literally can see the thing spinning on the reel to reel. I'm sure my son sees the MP3 thing going whatever you got that spotify in your head telling you that you don't you're not good at math <laughs> gosh um 
Yeah. Well, so one thing, uh, you know, you mentioned some of these old 80s movies, and I just want to give a little shout out to Jonathan McIntosh, who runs Pop Culture Detective uh, YouTube channel. And um, he has a great couple of videos that go through the construction of masculinity and geek culture that um, really um, delve into that with a lot of fun clips and uh, good sociology theory mixed in there um, is a great explainer of really how um, this unfortunate thing happened, which is that people who felt like they were downtrodden. You, know, you talked about being shoved in a locker. And that was so much of geek culture early on is we are the ones that are on the bottom of the heap of, you know, high school society or whatever it is. And this space, geek cultures, whether it's fandoms like Star Wars and Star Trek or the whole software computer space, this is our place where we finally get to rule and be ourselves and not be trampled. And, um, and like, you know, history tells us happens with <laughs> so many groups who have been marginalized and downtrodden when they finally get in charge, they just turn around and do the same thing to someone else. And, um, and it hurts my heart to see that where, um, you know, you see that even with the backlash against, um, you know, there have even been job postings that say in the job posting, like, um, no suits allowed, like, don't sh dare show up in a blazer, you know, to your interview or something. Yeah. And it's like, okay, I get it. You know, the, the strictness, the confinement of, the East Coast stereotypical office building where, you know, if you're not wearing a bespoke suit, you know, you could, you're never going to be judged as good enough, regardless of what's on the inside of your mind, you know, that Silicon Valley was such a reaction against that. But now are we just making hoodies the new bespoke suit? You know, okay, it's an advantage in that it's cheaper, I guess, but maybe we we don't have to just become the mirror image of the same kind of um, superficial judging of each other's talents, pre-judging yeah. of each other's talents. It seems like we've, we're having to thrash for a century here just so we can tell people to bring their whole selves to work. And if mm -hmm. you want to wear a suit, we, we, ha we, have a, a, we had a fellow at Microsoft and he loved wearing great suits, big, bright, colorful, wonderful suits. And people gave him a hassle for it, but he knew who he was and he liked his suits and he wore them because they made him happy and they set him up for success. Well, other people are like, you know, have their Crocs and their flip flops and it should be okay to do either of those things. Uh, the pop culture detective is a pop culture detective dot agency. I'll put that in the show notes. Mm -hmm. There's a great introduction there as well as a new uh, pop culture detective audio file. So if you like podcasts like this one, there is both video essays and audio ones as well, including one analyzing uh, the psychology of Ted Lasso that I think people will probably appreciate Ooh, as well. I haven't seen that one yet. I wanted yeah. to go back to something you said about the Barbie doll and um, and how toxic those messages can be. I just share a personal experience when I was an undergrad and, um, you know, was often one of just a tiny number of um, women in the room um, in uh, my computer science classes. And, um, and I overheard um, some guys sitting nearby me in class one time in um, the only class I ever had that was taught by a female computer science professor. Um, there were two in our department. I got to take a class with one of them. And I was so excited for that opportunity. And it really turned sour when um, the students in the class acted very disrespectfully towards her. Any mistake she made at any time, however minor or quickly corrected, they would jump all over it. Um, but I overheard these students uh, making fun of her. And so I thought I would bring my plucky self. And so I whispered to them, hey, you know, the very first computer programmer ever was a woman, Ada <laughs> Lovelace. And I really thought that was like the slam dunk that would end the argument. And um, instead, I got this note passed back to me and it said, 
oh, really? Um, what was the program? And then they wrote in little pseudocode under it, um, while true, do dishes. And it just was, <laughs> uh, you know, it just is so unnecessary. And, um, you know, I later became a teacher and found out that um, the students who show off and display the most bravado in class are basically never the ones who are actually doing the best. So if anyone out there listening is in a class and feels intimidated by the person who raises their hand and does the more of a comment than a question that has a ton of uh, jargon packed in, just know that person's probably performing worse than you in the class. But. <laughs> what would you tell our listeners who are either early in career just starting out, or folks like myself that are trying to send the ladder back down? What can we do with information like this, with a syllabus like this, to educate ourselves and change how we behave at work for the positive? Uh, you know, the big thing I would say is that um, sexism and especially racism are not so much about actually the experiences like the one I just shared, where there's some very explicit malice um, and meanness from one person to another. Um, they're really more about systems. And so, uh, you know, just that classic advice, if someone tells you that you've behaved in a way that is um, racially insensitive or, uh, or whatever, instead of saying, hey, but I'm nice, so that's not possible, um, realize that... Um, that that's not how that works, that we can um, have impact that's harmful, even if that's not our intention. And what you really have to look at is how things sit in terms of big systems where um, regardless of how you feel as an individual, some folks are systematically put on top and some focus, folks are systematically oppressed and marginalized. And then if you're not taking that into account, if you're not explicitly, intentionally countering that, you're almost certainly unintentionally furthering it. And that's just a hard pill to swallow if you are not someone who's constantly been on the underside of that equation and is therefore, you know, very acutely aware of it. Yeah. Yeah. If you're not the good Samaritan, then you're probably a bystander watching something go down and you should probably mm. jump in and be the good mm. Samaritan. Great way of putting it. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Cynthia Lee, for chatting with me today. I really appreciate you. We've oh, been trying to put this fun. together for a while, and it's, yes. a, it's a joy to talk to you. <laughs> Thanks. We have been talking with Dr. Cynthia Lee. She's a senior lecturer in the computer science department at Stanford. You can check her out online at her Stanford profile. I'll put links to the syllabus in the show notes, as well as the link there to the pop culture detective agency that she recommends. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next